Hi there, I'm Matthew Lester from the Rhodes Business School. This is a short lecture about the rules to the game of business. How far are we allowed to push things? Are we regulated? Are we not? Let's look at all the basic philosophies around what's going on. So it starts off with a picture of an old man. Back in 1962, a year after I was born, he published Capitalism and Freedom, in which he made the most extraordinary statement. He said, there is one and only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits. And we look at that and we say, what was he smoking? Yet the whole world followed him for years and years and years. This lecture is going to go into that and explore in some more detail what on earth is going on. So, we see that the likes of Friedman, if we take him at his word, we can say we can go to the Amazon jungle and cut it all down, providing it is profitable and legal. But today businesses are saying, is that really something you want businesses to do? And when we go to Nigeria, we see the flaming of natural gases that has caused enormous environmental and human disasters. Is that something that can be justified purely on the basis that it is legal? To be fair to Friedman, his statement does go on a little bit further. Let's go and have a look at some more of the stuff that he wrote. The sentence actually carries on and it says, so long as it stays within the rules of the game which is to say, without deception or fraud. Well, there hasn't been much deception and fraud involved in all of this. It's just gone on on the basis that it's legal. And that's perhaps where Friedman comes short. Let's have a look at some more of the stuff that Friedman wrote. He said, the best economic climate at which business can exist is a privatized, deregulated one. So, if the legislator is now going to create a comprehensive set of rules to address all aspects of the game, surely that's going to make a very complicated and very regulated society. So was Friedman again contradicting himself. Let's move over to tax. That's something I'm supposed to know a little bit about. And see how they've dealt with this in the tax courts. And this goes back to, all the way to 1936, where Lord President Clyde, had the following to say about observing the law. It is trite law that His Majesty's subjects are free, if they can, to make their arrangements so their cases may fall outside the scope of the taxing acts. They incur no legal liabilities and, strictly speaking, no moral censures. If, having considered the lines drawn down by the legislature for imposing their taxes, they make it their business to walk outside them. So if we look at the current debacle which is going on with some of the big names in world business about the levels of their tax morality, what business is saying is, we've observed the law and we've made it our business to step outside the law. There's nothing wrong with that so long as we have done it without deception or fraud. However, perhaps when we look at business society, it's changed. In the old days under Friedman, we were looking at the efficiency spectrum only. We were saying, is a business efficient or inefficient? Is it making profits or not? And we based most business decisions just on that. But today that's changed, and today we bring in another spectrum, what's called the social spectrum. And the social spectrum is asking us to examine, is something morally wrong or morally good? So we start measuring across those spectrums, and if we're very clever with PowerPoint, we can actually invert them and create a new matrix for business decisions. Now, if we look at world leaders today, possibly what we are saying is the likes of Donald Trump and David Cameron. They are saying business is about making profits and total efficiency. But there is a new movement, the likes of Thomas Piketty, Bernie Sanders in America, and Corbyn, who are saying there is more to business than just making a profit. Let's see what else it entails. So, there we have the spectrum. Now we have to find a starting point for starting a business. Perhaps it goes like this. If a business is not profitable, then it is a non-starter, and it's business's business to make sure that the business doesn't even start in the first place. 
We also have to say, the business must observe the law. The game must be legal before it can start. By doing this, we have eliminated a lot of the discussion that goes on about the morality of business. If a business decision is illegal, that's the end of the story. We don't have to go into the morals of the case. So let's extend it a little bit further. And we say, what Friedman is saying is so long as a business is profitable, the fact that it might be morally wrong or inequitable is not the issue. The question is, was it legal and done without deception or fraud? After that, you may proceed. Well, that's changing. Now we have to also ask the question, and it's a very important question in South Africa today, what happens when a business matter is morally right but legally wrong? Now this is interestingly enough been addressed by the Constitutional Court in the matter of Cool Ideas versus Hubbard. And they made some interesting remarks. They said, it cannot be expected of law that where there is a clear statutory prohibition, we can simply ignore that. To do so is simply overriding the law. We can't do that. Again, this em emphasizes that a business must be legal before it can commence. But what happens where a business is possibly morally right but legally wrong? Let's have a look in this case, for example, at the marijuana debate. Some believe it is your human right to smoke it, same as cigarettes. It's even your human right to trade it. But in terms of the current law, that's illegal. So even if it was morally right to trade it, you can't do so until you change the law. And the way that you change the law is to then go to the Constitutional Court and say, this has a moral, ethical or human right problem. You must override the law. Then the business becomes legal and then we can talk about it. But society is expecting a lot more from business today. In the words of Professor Henry Mintzberg and his colleagues, they are saying corporations are economic entities to be sure, but they are also social institutions that must justify their existence by their overall contribution to society. So let's go back to that spectrum and say what Mintzberg and his friends are saying is that you have to be morally right to commence business. And they have moved the upright to a little bit further to the right of where it was in the past. That's what the whole debate about ethics, morality and inequality is all about. So if, for example, we take the Oak Bay debacle, we can say there has never been any allegation that the Gupta directors have done anything illegal in their administration of Oak Bay. But the stakeholders, that's their financiers and other people that they deal with, have said that the Gupta Zuma Association is morally wrong and unfair, and consequently they're not prepared to deal with them. The stakeholders have thus moved the spectrum to the right. And no matter how profitable the business might be, that's the end of the matter. The business is not going to commence. Now let's take this all a little bit further. What would Friedman's response be to all of this? He might say all is lost if we are allowed to change the rules of the game according to the whims of society and irrespective of what the legislator may be. The playing field has thus become a whole lot smaller and it is in fact not regulated at all. Businesses run and prosper according to the whims of society. Well, Friedman's alternative response might have been, and this is important, by participating in the game, the stakeholders are expressing their most fundamental liberty of all, the right to choose who they want to deal with. Is that not the very line engages in open and free competition that Friedman has always been banging off about? So let's go back to the Google tax matter. And Google and a lot of other big companies have been saying, I have been obeying the law. What is happening is that the UK tax authorities have looked at our affairs in terms of the UK taxing acts as they currently stand, and we have settled with them. And that's the end of the matter. No, society is now demanding more from Google. They're saying Google can afford to pay more, and it must do so. 
We must look at the substance of all their transactions and how they move money all over the world to reduce their taxes, and not the actual form of their legal arrangements. Now, this has been addressed in the tax courts by the famous Duke of Westminster judgment. And the judgment looks at this and says, this is the so-called doctrine of substance over form. And the sooner that this is dismissed from society, the better, because it is no more than substituting the certain and uncrooked cord of discretion for the golden and straight meter wand of the law. That doesn't help. But what we can say is that the world has changed. The answers are no longer coming from the laureate philosophers and economists as implemented by politicians. Today, the answer is coming from what is socially acceptable to the people, or what we refer to as the stakeholders of the business. We can see examples of this in the recent work of the Davis Tax Committee on which I work. We were asked to look at the tricky question of increasing the VAT rate in South Africa. You don't need to read all of that stuff down there, but basically what we're saying is to increase the VAT rate, most economists would agree that that is the least damaging thing you can do to an economy if the fiscus needs money. But you can write all of that stuff and how VAT is a better tax than corporate tax or personal tax. But it boils down to one line. It says, however, an increase in the VAT would have a greater negative impact on inequality than an increase in personal income tax or corporate income tax. So if you've got that in your way, you can't increase the VAT rate. And South Africa's VAT rate remains at 14%, despite the arguments of laureate economists. So note the difference. There you have Boren Duplessis, the Minister of Finance in 1991, who brought the VAT system into South Africa. He bullied it into place despite opposition from the people. Today, no matter who is the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Finance has to listen to the people and the people are saying, don't increase the VAT rate. That is the end of the story, regardless of the economic considerations. We can also see this internationally. If we look at the alliance between Thatcher and Reagan during the early 80s, they were all great disciples of Milton Friedman and they imposed draconian economic policies on their countries regardless of the collateral damage on people. And they got away with it. They were able to bully it all through. If we bring that forward 30 years, we now get to the new Conservative government of David Cameron and some of their tax ideals and economic policies going forward. And they've taken them to Parliament and they've had to back down. Why? They simply couldn't sell it to the people and they couldn't bully it through. So where are we going with all of this? What we are saying in the whole question is that your business has to be profitable and legal before we can even consider starting a business. However, due to the stakeholders, we have actually moved things further to the right and a business cannot operate on the basis that it is morally wrong unfair or inequitable. We have basically established a new spectrum which says for a business to work it must be both legal, profitable and morally right. Once we have done all of that we then extend the benchmark of being morally right and profitable in the search for best practice which is morally perfect and also profitable. And that's a huge challenge for us going forward. I'm Matthew Lester at the Rhodes Business School. Thank you for your attention.